My name is Nicole Newell, and I'm one of the program managers for Sustainable Solano. So we are located in Solano County, which is part of the San Francisco Bay Area in California. And our mission is to nurture initiatives for the good of the whole. So welcome to this evening's presentation, an introduction to nonviolent communication led by John Kenyon. So as an organization, we were really looking for a format to discuss difficult topics. And we all realize how important it is to talk about the elephants in the room, but it's not always easy and it can be quite uncomfortable, but it's necessary um, to discuss these topics in order to heal and grow. And really the one thing I'm learning is it's all about relationships and how we interact with each other. So John Kenyon was recommended to us as a speaker on nonviolent communication. So we looked into bringing him um, in on both a public format like this evening, and then we'll also be working with him with our team privately. So during the presentation, feel free to put questions into the chat and we'll have a Q&A at the end of the presentation. And we'd like to bring at least one person into um, on live to interact with John. So just keep your, you know, keep thinking about maybe um, doing that if you're feeling brave enough. Um, so all the, and all the resources that John will provide tonight, I'll, we'll send you an email tomorrow with links to all the resources. So John Kenyon has devoted his life and career to furthering human connection and cooperation around the world through empathetic communication. And boy, is that needed now more than ever. So he's a trainer and a coach, a mediator, speaker, and author dedicated to sharing the skills, practices, and structures of empathy and consciousness in conversation as part of health and wellness. So you can learn more about the incredible work that he's doing and find great resources on his website. And we'll put that into the chat. So welcome, welcome, John. We are so grateful to have you here tonight. Um, thank you so much for being here. And the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Nicole. And uh, thank you everyone for taking some time this evening to, to be with me, to be with us, talking about, yeah, something that I feel is uh, daily more important as I look out into the world and see what's happening, the, the amount of violence and suffering around the world, and uh, even uh, close to home here if you're in the Bay Area. Uh, so... Yeah, um, my background is in a, a body of work called nonviolent communication. Some people use that term like with lowercase letters as a kind of a general term, uh, but there is a, an international body of work called nonviolent communication, NVC, uh, created by a uh, man named Marshall Rosenberg, who I had the tremendous uh, fortune, good fortune to be able to work closely with for many years um, before he, he passed um, a number of years ago now. And, but I, I like calling the body of work, uh, like the work that I do, I like to refer to it, as Nicole said in the introduction, empathic communication. Uh, I just, some people get, uh, have a reaction to the word nonviolence and think think it's all about you know violence or nonviolence and and if you know the history of of Gandhi and the um, in India and Martin Luther King here in the United States and many other people around the world who've used the uh, the practice of nonviolence for social change and social movements uh, liberation movements uh, that's sort of where the where the name comes from but not everybody knows that so. I'm one of about, I think it's uh, around 800 certified uh, NVC trainers all over the world. Um, the work is being, this work is being done um, in many, if most probably countries all over the world. And um, yeah, there's, hmm. some reason, yeah, just thinking about how uh, all over this, this world, there's these practices to try to help us human beings um, connect 
where we get so disconnected and so into conflict and um, we lose touch with what I feel is, is our, our nature um, to be compassionate, to be kind, to be caring and loving. And that that's, you know, that's built into us as social creatures. Um, and as we see, though, we can, we can get very much, um, very far from that and do all kinds of um, harm to one another, or just get into all kinds of kind of ordinary conflicts, like in our families or workplaces or wherever that, that can really take a toll, though, on... Um, not being able to have the quality of relationships that we want. So this, this body of work really is, is how do we come back to that natural place of empathy, empathic connection when we lose it? And also how to deepen into it. I like to think of, of, of this as, as like being in conversation, communication and conversation within ourselves and with others that's nourishing, that really feeds our soul, our hearts and souls. And a lot of times we can communicate kind of on the surface, even if there isn't conflict going on. Um, but to really, to be able to communicate in a way that has the depth that really feeds us and, and fulfills us, nourishes us. So for me, that's also what this is about. And that as Nicole mentioned too in the intro, I, I see this as part of health and wellness. So there's a very uh, you know, growing movement and, and uh, sustainable Solano part of that in terms of the, the, uh, the environment. And, but the food we eat, the diet, that all kinds of ways that we humans are learning how to be healthier. And to me, this like, way of communicating empathically, compassionately, nonviolently when, when we're in conflict or wanting to create uh, social change, any kind of change, that um, part of that movement, that w the, the larger movement of being healthy and, and creating wellness uh, and peace on our planet. So that's what I'll be sharing with you, some um, specifics about some basic kind of elements for today. That The body of work is um, pretty extensive and uh, there's a lot to it. So I'm just going to give you a little taste of some of the, the basic foundational elements. Um, but hopefully just, just from this little bit of time together, you'll be able to uh, walk away with some things that you can use right away in your life to, uh, to make a difference. All right. Um, so yes, yeah, so maybe to go a little further into the, what I, my understanding at this point, and I've, I've been doing this work for over, over 20 years now, and uh, the NVC work's been around for probably 50, 60 years uh, when, when Marshall Rosenberg was traveling all over the United States and then all over the world sharing this work. And he did that for, for decades. And all these people all over, like myself, that uh, are sharing it um, in all kinds of different ways. And um, so what an insight that Marshall had is about language. And that there's language that, and this in some ways will be obvious, but it's, it's like, unless you study this kind of work, it, it, it isn't also. That there's language that, that kind of keeps us connected in that natural way. And then there's language that can really disconnect us, uh, that, that can lead to that, that, that conflict and suffering and violence that we can get into. And violence isn't just physical. Uh, violence can be the words that we use and the way that we, you know, relate and interact on, a, on emotional, psychological levels, uh, it's not just physical. So um, that the language we um, can make a huge difference that either, either leads us towards that, that connectedness or away from it towards, towards disconnection. And there are these four components that are at the, at the core of the work. I think of it as like the, the DNA, the, the cellular level of kind of everything else that builds around it is four basic components of communication. And I'll pull up a, a handout for, to share with you on the screen. So 
So, yeah. Observation, feeling, need, and request. And these some core distinctions that go with each one, observation versus evaluation or judgment, which I think of as about the language of the mind, then feeling versus thinking, language of the body, and needs versus wants or strategies, and that's about language of the universal, and then request versus demand, language of giving and receiving. So OFNR is the, the acronym, OFNR, and those four components. So I, I'd like to just take you on a little tour through those components first, and then I'll uh, share with you uh, one of my favorite stories to tell out of my own experience. Um, and then there can be some time to uh, do me to do some demonstration work with one or more of you if you're willing to come forward and come live with me and that's that's really my favorite way so I, i'll give the context and share with you some things for a bit but then what i really love to do is is interact and you know like if you have a situation that you're dealing with and then i could just uh, do a little um coaching almost like just some some guiding through through these components with your situation and and then others get to 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 witness that and and we all get to learn together and experience together and see where these kind of shifts occur in our experience by using these components so uh yeah i hope at least one of you will want to come and do that with me uh towards the end so observation yeah and and i like to think of these four components as some people when they study this work they it like it's like a it can be a sort of a formulaic mechanical technique of these steps and i've never related to the the components that way for me each one is its own like doorway into connection and and connection is is kind of a, a mystery in a way what is connection really what is what is that um and and so for me one of the answers is it's where we connection is where we can um, hold the differences, all the differences we have with each other, because we're, we're grounded in something underlying that, that's our commonality, where, we, where there's a sameness, a oneness, even if you will, where we're all part of the same human family, we're part of the same web and fabric of life on the planet. So to, uh, to be able to um, that each of the components is this doorway to that connection, to, to come back to it or to deepen further into the connection. Oh, and, they, and the connection is a place where we can naturally be moved to want to contribute to one another, um, to give and receive out of the enjoyment of that. So now I'll start with observation. And, and here is the distinction with like what we what we observe that's that's happening that we might want to talk about, communicate about, and that how we often mix that up with our thoughts, our, our, how we're evaluating. And, um, and then there's a way we can evaluate that's about judgment, the way we judge right, wrong, good, bad, appropriate, inappropriate, normal, abnormal, things like that. So the ability to to observe um, is actually, it's, it's uh, surprisingly difficult and um, to not, to, to, to be able to just be able to talk about what's happening separate from what we're thinking about it, how we're evaluating and judging it. So maybe you can, if you want, think of a situation, maybe something, it could be something that's pleasant, positive, um, but, it, yeah, you might want to pick something that's difficult, challenging, maybe in your personal life or your work life or out in the social political world that, that you're reacting to. Um, but yeah, if you can think of uh, uh, something and and then so there's there's a way we can use language that's about observation language versus how we're evaluating. 
But for me, what it's each of these dimensions too is about dimensions of awareness, like how we can be conscious and aware. Because that to me is like, that's where, where communication shows up, right? How the language, the words that we use and the images and the, you know, the body language. So all this different languages and, and, and then with words, the concepts, all that shows up in awareness, right? If we can be aware and conscious, then we have choice about what language do we use. And if we don't, if we're not mindful enough, then we're just running on autopilot, which most of us do most of the time. But with practice, and I, this, this learning, this methodology to me is really goes hand in hand with meditation and mindfulness training because of that, that we can, with, with more and more awareness, we can choose how to, how to use these words and where to focus our attention. So just even as I invite you to think of a situation, you, know, you can be aware of, of, of a situation coming into your mind. And then what is it that, that happened? Or maybe it's something that's sort of ongoing, but if you th you're thinking back on something that occurred, something someone else said or did, something you said or did. So just the ability to be, to observe, Right, to observe what's happening rather than lost and kind of caught up in our, in our thinking. Yeah, so to be the observer of our, of our mind, of how our mind is perceiving, how our mind is evaluating and judging. So you might want to write down if you something you can write on. You know, what is it, if you picked out like something about the situation that's say difficult for you. Maybe it's something more in the past or, or something very present and alive for you at, at this time in your life. But yeah, what, what is the thing that, that was said or done? And, and then see if you can, what, what are you telling yourself about that? What are your evaluations and judgments? So I like to use this little made up example of like, let's say you're at some kind of social event, work or personal, and somebody you know, a friend, colleague comes in and into the room and they go around, they talk to other people, they don't come talk to you, and you don't even see them looking at you. Um, that would be the observation, right? That the person comes in, they move around, they talk to different people, they don't come over and talk to you. And if I asked you so you know, what happened if you got upset about this? And I said, what happened that you, you know, you're acting to you might say, well, this, uh, this friend just ignored me. And it just kind of blew me off. So a lot of times that people, we think like that's the observation that this person ignored me. And instead of, no, actually the observation is if we're just observing what we're perceiving. Yeah, the person comes in, they move around, they talk to different people, right? That's what we're observing and that they didn't come talk to us. And the, the thought, the judgment is we got ignored. Yeah, they ignored us. So that's just a little example, of that difference between just what happens and then like the story we tell about it. And often that story, we're, we're story making creatures as human beings. We love to, to, to tell stories and, and, and um, make meaning and interpretation of what we see and what we hear. Um, and often that is, it's in that, that sense of, of who's right and wrong, like who's to blame, you know, who's at fault, who wronged us, who did something they shouldn't have done or should do, right? So all that gets, gets uh, kind of woven into when we talk about what, what happened. That we're that we're reacting to, and the, the 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 problem with that is that if if we do think in those terms, if we use that language of judgment, that kind of moralistic judgment, off that triggers the way I think of it, it triggers the fight or flight system, the part of our brain that is about um, survival and threat and danger. Right, the amygdala um, neuroscience has done a, a lot of study in that part of the brain and how we get. Uh, we get 
into fear and anger and, and uh, um, those kind of survival responses. It's also called the stress response. Um, so when that gets, and it gets activated, if, if we are judging other people, right, then, with that, then uh, well, if we feel judged by others, yeah, that often that triggers our defensiveness. If, if we, as someone, we have a sense someone is, is blaming us, telling us we did something wrong, criticizing us, yeah, then that can trigger our, our fight or flight system, yeah. But if also if we're judging other people, right, just having the judgment ourselves, even if, even if we're not, and often we do judge ourselves, right, we tell ourselves these, the, these beliefs and uh, uh, evaluations of what's wrong with us, what's wrong, uh, wrong with us. But even if we're judging other people, that can trigger the fight or flight system, right? Somebody else is doing something wrong and we get revved up about that. So just to be able to be aware of that difference, right? Just what, what's ha what we're observing and what language, can we just use language that's describing what happened? And then being aware and noticing, observing this way we judge and evaluate. And we can, we can observe both things actually, the what happens and how we're judging. Um, if we're, if we have enough mindfulness, yeah. And, but a lot of times we don't, we're just kind of unconsciously swept up in our thinking. So this practice is really deep, um, in terms of just that level of being able to be aware of what our mind is doing. What's the language our mind is using and can we be aware of it? And then we can start making choices about it. What I find is if we move more towards observation language, then it like there's a calming effect of that. And it just, just being in observation, just being the witness and aware tends to calm that um, if, if we are getting triggered into that part of the brain, but also using language that's more observational also tends to just kind of soften and quiet the mind when it's getting revved up. So notice if that does that for you, if you're thinking of a situation if you can catch yourself where maybe you're making some of those judgments of yourself or the other person, notice what's it like if you search for, oh, but what if I just tried to say it in terms of what happened or I just try to see it in my mind like, okay, this happened and then this was said and right, like you're watching a movie screen, yeah. And a lot of times we're in a movie and we don't, we forget we're in the movie theater, right? And we're so caught up in the movie. But if we remember, if we kind of wake up to, oh yeah, right, I'm in a theater right now watching a movie, right? We can just kind of observe what's happening. So notice if that has an effect on you, just doing that with that situation, how it, how it impacts you. Okay, so now let's go to feeling. From observation to feeling. Oh, and then of course, uh, yeah, one, one more thing about observation. If we communicate more observationally to people, other people, then, it, then it's less triggering for them often too, right? The more we communicate around with those judgments, sometimes anyways, that can, that can be what triggers the conflict and the disconnection. Something I'll get to in a little bit is the, gr the great thing about this is if we learn that the language of judging, blaming, criticizing, we can translate that into what we want and need and value behind that. So in my little example, like if I, um, if I overhear myself say, oh, I'm being ignored, uh, I can kind of translate that. Oh, there's, a, there's something that I want and need underneath that. So we can, any, anytime we hear that kind of judgment language, we can, we can, at least we have the possibility to, to translate it, like you translate from English to Spanish or something, to, to hear what we, you know, in the word evaluate, like value, right? What do we value? What do we want? What's important to us? What matters to us? And what matters as human beings, right? So we can take anything like any kind of judgment and de kind of decode it and translate it. And um, so that's, a, that's another Thing we can do, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll say more about that when we get to the third component of, of need and our human needs. So if we go for next though to 
to feeling this this component of feeling i think of that's kind of dropping from the the mind and awareness of what the mind is doing perceiving thinking down into the body and and i don't know about you but i i, I could spend a lot of time up in my head and and so to, to to be able to keep dropping down into being present in our bodies so see if you can do that now even just that's that sense of bringing your attention down into your whole body as you're hearing my words and you're thinking about your situation. And as you think about your situation, what do you feel? What do you feel in your body? It could be just different sensations. If you scan through your body, what sensations are you feeling? Like a tightness in your shoulders or a ache in your heart or a clench in your belly or so there's physical sensation that we can feel and then there's emotions right different emotion like anger and sadness fear or happiness joy celebration gratitude yeah so see if you can feel that and then put language so this consciously putting language, consciously talking to ourselves or to others right now, just how you talk to yourself, how we can communicate with ourselves. What's the language of the body that the body is communicating, right? The body is giving us these feelings of, of sensation and emotion, and we can tune into that with our awareness and feel it and then put words to it that are accurate. So a lot of times when we use words to talk about our feelings and our body, our bodily experience, we end up using the, the thoughts again. We mix up feeling and thought. So we might say things like, I feel like this person's being rude and disrespectful. I feel that that's really inappropriate. Notice I use the word feel, but then I followed it with more like a thought of what's going on. My, my, my story, my interpretation. So another way we, we'd say, I feel and follow it with something like I feel, like I said, I feel ignored. I feel like rejected. I feel abandoned. I feel attacked. And right? so all those is like what, what we're thinking people are doing to us. It's not really what's going on in our bodies. Right? If I think I'm being, ignored so in this little example if i go back to at the social situation and my friend talks to other people doesn't come over and talk to me how am i feeling you know i might say yeah i feel ignored okay but what in my body what do i feel oh, i feel you know kind of disappointed i feel irritated maybe a little hurt you know? or maybe confused What's going on? Why? Yeah, something I said, um, or maybe nothing at all. But sometimes this is what what we do, right? We make up. We try to understand what's going on. So for you in your situation, what are you feeling in your body? What emotions, sensations, and notice if what comes to you is seems like it's still more of a thought more of your thinking about what people are doing rather than what your body is communicating, how you're feeling in your body. Be anxious, frustrated, curious, joyful, playful. Yeah, those kind of inner. So the, the idea is it's an inward focus. It's going inside versus out and sort of thinking and judging outward. Right. Okay. And then, well, no, and notice how that is to do these two things. One is to that be able to kind of step back, observe your experience, put language to it that's more observational. And if you are having thoughts, you know, judgments, you know, to be able to notice and observe that kind of that from a, it's kind of stepping back a little bit from that and then to drop into your body and feel what's happening in your body and then put this kind of language to to what you're experiencing that really is about your body it's about your inner experience 
and just kind of notice what that's like. Do you feel any shifts that happen? Like as you kind of go back and forth, maybe from more thought to observation and feeling, can you feel any, even little subtle shifts of like, oh, there's something that relaxes, something that kind of softens and opens in you, less reactive. You almost feel your mind get a little quieter. That's what I experience. Okay. So let's go to um, need. So I think this is the language of the universal. So going from the particularity of what we observe and think and feel in our bodies, kind of our mind and body level to something that's more expansive. What do we all need as human beings? What do we all want everywhere around the world? We all want the same basic qualities, love, respect, caring, kindness, autonomy and freedom, community, belonging, safety, security, healthy food, health in our environment, order, beauty. So here, when we get to, this is like getting to the hidden. We are, uh, th what, uh, this, this level, this dimension of the universal, of, what, of, of, of the, the needs that we all, you know, can underlie our thoughts and feelings. So we're, we're, we have more access to like what we think and feel, but we have to sort of search, I find, to, we have to get in that, uh, that practice, the habit of looking for what's hidden of these underlying needs. Yeah. So if I see someone talking to other people, not me, right, and I notice I have that judgment of being ignored and I'm feeling angry or hurt or confused, you know, and connecting that down deeper into what is it that I want? and want at the level we all want everywhere on the planet. So in my little made up situation, what, what I want, well, I want friendship, connection. I want care, I want consideration, um, understanding, if I have something going on that I don't know. So see what it is for you. What comes to you? Can you find any of the, these, this universal language for what we all, all of us humans want and need that would go with your situation? What are you wanting, needing at this human level? And notice what it's, you might have to play with the words because it, it, uh, it takes some fine tuning sometimes to find just the right language that, go, ah, that's it. That's, what, oh, it's respect. That's what it is. It's about respect or it's about security. Or, you know. And if it starts off specific, right? The idea that needs are not specific to any person, place or thing. So it's always about what's uni these universal qualities. So if you um, start off with, oh, I really need her to, you know, to say this differently. Yeah, okay, if that happened, what would that give you? What would that give you if, if what you want more specifically happened, what would it give you that we all want? That we all have these shared needs, shared being in these needs that we all are this commonality, this underlying commonality that, that is, is this larger wholeness that we're part of. So it's like literally expanding our self from this small self to this large interconnected, interdependent, interbeing self that is this wholeness, larger wholeness that we're all part of. So it's language that takes us to that place. And often there's this feeling of, of love and connectedness that goes with getting to that level of our experience. So see if you notice anything about that. And then once we get to our needs and we get conscious and we kind of expand our consciousness so we're, we're not just this small limited self but we're more expansive and interconnected, then is there a request? Do you have a request of yourself 
or others. And that the, 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 the essence of the request is, is going love in action. So often we can, when we're connected to that more empathic, wider level, um, there's that desire that's natural to want to be compassionate, to want to be giving and receiving. Yeah, give, and we can make requests to receive from people. We can want to give things to people out of that connecting to what our needs are, other people's needs are. So just see if something, the idea is something specific, like in this little made up situation can be what, what would you, you know, to ask, the request might be to ask my friend, you know, on, you know what happened? Um, very simple example, but you know, what is the request? Okay, I'm gonna, uh, um, tell you a quick story, and then I'm going to see about interacting with one of you. Um, yeah, so this is a story of a um, story I love to tell with my son. Um, when he was nine years old, I was the assistant coach of a baseball team, his baseball team, and we got to the championship game. And uh, big game, all the parents, tons of people out watching uh, in our local community and uh where our team is is losing and my son gets up to bat it's like halfway through the game and it's uh you know it's very emotional for all of us and um he and he's one of the better kids on the team and he gets up and he hits this beautiful line drive over the center field or all the way to the fence and he's racing around the bases and he and this other kid get home and and it's just like celebration, jubilation. Everybody's just so excited uh, on, our, on our team. Um, and I'm just just the proudest, you know, father ever. And uh, and then the coach and the other team comes racing out and starts talking to the umpires. And what he ended up doing was saying that our head coach, I was the assistant coach, that our head coach had touched one of the players not, not my son, but the other uh, that was running the bases had touched him to kind of help him because he'd fallen down. And, and you can't do that as a, as a coach. You can't touch a player. Um, so he'd accused him of that. And, and, and nobody else saw that, but he did. And the umps ended up changing the call and neither, home, neither run counted. So it basically took away the home run from, from my son. And I was livid because I, I was thinking that this other coach, I already had a lot of enemy images of him and thought he was a jerk. And, uh, um, but I was just furious, you know, and um, we ended up, we lost the game. And then I was like, literally, I was feeling like this hatred. <laughs> this was a number of years ago. Um, and, uh, but I realized that, yeah, okay, I, I actually have some skills here. I could, I forgot for a little while because I was so emotional and so upset. But you know what? I know how to work on this. Okay, let me do some work on myself. And I went through, you know, what did I, what were my judgments? You know, this guy's a cheater and he, all he wants to win at all costs and he doesn't care about the kids and he's just this asshole. And, and then what are my feelings? Man, I was just furious and rage and anger. And then why? So I could name these things in my experience and then I could go to why, what, what needs are underneath my thoughts and feelings? And I, what I got to was was love, the love of a father for his son and the team. And, and then the anger melted and became this deep sorrow and kind of heartbreak because I saw my son crying after that. And, but it, it just, everything, it just became, I got so in touch with the, the immensity of my love and care for my son and for this team that we'd worked so hard to get that far. And it was just, I could just feel myself sink into a sorrow, but it was like the sweetness of how much love I felt and wanted to protect this one need to protect my son from this sense of loss and taking away such an incredibly high experience and moment of, of accomplishment. So just going to that place, a lot of my judgments kind of dropped away, my anger subsided, and I, but I still was kind of upset. And then I thought, okay, let me try to empathize with the coach. 
why did he do that? Like, can I see him as a human being? You know, he saw something, right? He's, he's, he saw my coach do the something. He's probably feeling really stressed and anxious and angry too, because he came racing out there and he was talking. And what was he needing? What was he wanting? Oh my God, the same thing as me, of course. His son was on the other team. His, his love for his son and his team and wanting to protect them from something getting taken away from them. Oh my God, we have the same needs. And it just, everything just totally shifted in me. I didn't like the way he did it. It, it was still hurt a lot that, that it happened the way that it did, but something just radically shifted in me by going through this empathic process of these. And then what was the request of myself? It was to go talk to the guy. And I'd never talked to him. I'd known him for that whole year and some previous years in the, in the league. And I never liked him. And I heard stories, like, but I, you know what? I, got, I wanna talk to him. I wanna check out why he did this and what was going on because it looked like he was, you know, sort of cheating and being an underhanded and trying to win at all costs. And I was like, oh, let me go talk to him. So I did, I, you know, I sort of prepared myself this way, right? And I went and I, and I went up and I, and I, otherwise, I, I, if I didn't do this, I probably wouldn't have gone to talk to him. I would have just had this uh, judgment of him, but I went and I talked and I found out that he had had all, he and many of the parents on the other side and they, they all had these big judgments of our head coach that he was, he had this reputation that I didn't know about of being kind of trying to win at all costs and cheating and doing underhanded things. Like all the things I was judging this guy for, he and this, this, the other team and many other people in the league had this judgment of our coach. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't. And they give a bunch of examples. And I was like, well, yeah, but you don't really know him the way I do. So, everybody had, was having their judgments, right? And nobody was really talking to anybody about it. But because I went to talk to him and I could really hear him directly, I suddenly totally humanized him for me. And he, uh, um, I just, my heart immediately opened more towards him. And I actually started to like the guy. Just as I was talking to him, I was like, man, I've never spent time with him, really talked to him. And I started to really feel my heart open to him. And we went on, he went on to be a friend of mine after that. And, and my son was on, he became the, the coach of the all-star team and my son was on that team. And so it would have been pretty uncomfortable if I hadn't cleared things up with him. And uh, it was amazing. It was a total transformation, radical transformation, just by being able to know how to go through and use these components and then use, and use that to talk to him and understand his experience. So... And, and that kind of thing for me happens all the time. It happens in the trainings I do all the time, but that to me, that's one of the best examples of a, of a, of a story.